Some neologisms in American politics live out a peculiar and treacherous pattern of being. After being coined by an academic and being given a strict narrow definition, the term floats around in subject-specific papers, remaining a mystery to the rest of the world. Then, through some process, either intentional or accidental, the term lands at the feet of normal people, who pick it up and inject it into everyday conversation. Therefore, inevitably, the term comes to have both a technical and a colloquial use. This can be a good thing. A term might deserve to be adopted by the masses. But sometimes this separation comes at the cost of understanding. Systemic racism is one such term. At its root, it might seem to have an innocuous meaning, but its invocation in a debate is almost guaranteed to drive the two sides at one another's throats. I, and perhaps you, have come away from those debates with the impression that there must be something fundamentally contentious about the idea of systemic racism. Look through YouTube and you will find it is an endless source of anger, confrontation, friction, frustration, derision, dismissal, and ultimately, confusion. This lack of understanding would seem to be nonsensical. After all these years of speakers, tutorials, and video explanations, you would think at last we would have had an authoritative explanation or refutation of the idea, yet one glance at the comment section will show you that in spite of everything, a divide remains. Even those on the left, who allegedly agree on the concept, will find themselves tangled in their own attempts at discussing it. It's like everybody f***ing forgot what the f systemic racism actually meant. It doesn't, it, like, the whole point of systemically racist structures is that they persevere and exist independent of any racial actors. What's going on here? What ideas within what's called systemic structural, or institutional racism have inspired such a vitriolic feud? And why do these discussions never seem to get anywhere? Before I begin outlining what I see are the fundamental disagreements between the two sides, and also outlining some of my critiques of both sides, I'm going to give you a very bare bones definition of what is meant by the term systemic racism in this context. The term institutional racism was coined by Stokely Carmichael in his book Black Power, the Politics of Liberation in America, which was published in 1967. The term was meant to distinguish between individual acts of racism from less overt, far more subtle, less identifiable sorts of unfairness. Carmichael believed that the presence of inequalities proved that such subtle racism existed. Disparate outcomes, therefore, are said to exist without direct or measurable cause. Which means that in this last clip, Stephen is correct. The term is only meant to apply when no overt individual or legal racism exists. Institutional racism, in the words of Carmichael, permeates the society. In that sense, it is systemic because these disparate outcomes can be found across many different dimensions of life, economics, health, education, criminal justice, and housing, to name a few. The word racism is there to inject some editorializing emotion, certainly Carmichael meant to make his opinion on the matter known, but its function in the phrase is purely to indicate what types of disparities this term refers to. Now, having heard the technical definition of the term, you might already be saying to yourself, wait a moment, that's not how people really use it. That's not how people argue about the term. And that's only one place where the confusion between the two sides really resides. Picture the typical debate on systemic racism, a discussion between an individual on the right and on the left. These two people are not members of high academia, but are political pundits, commentators, or politically informed citizens. The debate opens with, does systemic racism exist? And promptly, the two plant their flags on opposing sides. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. The discussion from there on out is predictable. The negative argument maintains that civil and legal discrimination is illegal, 
policies have been made race neutral, and so we cannot say that the system is racist. The positive side responds by pointing out the continued role of unfair policies, implicit bias, and the historical impact of slavery. The negative counters by acknowledging those factors, but emphasizing the more important role of contemporary factors. Then the positive comes back by arguing that those contemporary factors themselves were created through discrimination in the past. By the end of the conversation, they will speak two competing visions for the future. One to champion individual responsibility and reform, and the other to bring moral resolution with quotas and reparations. It may come as a surprise that both sides fundamentally agree on some points. They agree that historical racism, bias, unfairness, and behaviors all contribute to the current situation. As much as they may downplay, deflect, or dismiss any of those factors, all are at play to some measurable degree. They also agree that the removal of explicitly racist policies from institutions, while needed, did not end these disparities on its own. Some missing piece remains. Furthermore, both sides are confident that the disparities seen now are not set in stone. With the right actions made by the right persons, these disparities can shrink or even potentially disappear. However, there is one core problem to the discussion. While both sides believe they are discussing systemic racism, in reality, neither person is engaging with Carmichael's academic definition. Instead, the typical discussion about systemic racism usually devolves into competing, equally colloquial definitions of the term. Underneath the semantic confusion, what they really dispute is not whether systemic racism exists, but how they picture the causal chain behind racial disparities whereas systemic racism does not argue for a conventional causal chain. In other words, these two sides are disputing how to describe and solve the causes of racial disparities. In order to understand the differences between the two views, we're going to break them down into their descriptive and prescriptive components. On the descriptive side, we have the complex conception of the system. The complex conception views the system as an extremely complicated series of interconnected contributing factors. On the other hand, the radial conception views the system as a branching path, with every racial disparity being explicitly back traceable to racism. Next, we have the prescriptive differences. First, we have the mechanistic strategy, which sees outcomes as the result of precise mechanisms Therefore, the best way to change those outcomes is to address and disrupt the most immediate mechanisms. The restorative strategy sees outcomes as unjust results of systemic problems. That means the best way to change these outcomes is to close them consciously. For the remainder of this video, I'll be referring to the two views by the names of complex mechanistic and radial restorative. As you can see here, these are the fundamental differences between the two views. I'm not going to read them all off, so if you'd like to review them, you can pause the video. Here are some visual representations of how the two sides envision the causal chains involved. The radial restorative model visualizes the causal chain as a branching path. Every racial disparity, properly analyzed and traced, can be shown to be originally caused by racism. Therefore, from this model, Attacking the immediate cause is ineffective because it does not reach the root, perpetuating the cause of the disparity. Visually, radial restorative is arranged in a tree diagram with the common root at the center and the disparities seated at the furthest tips of each branch. The complex mechanistic model, on the other hand, visualizes causes as a web of interlocking factors and cycles. Not only are there a multiplicity of root, underlying, and immediate causes, but each piece of the causal chain can affect the others. Sometimes feedback loops can form between causes and results. And this is a simplified graphic representation. To understand the complexity, you would need to imagine an infinite fractal, with every box containing a causal chain or multiple chains within themselves. 
What should be understood from the complex mechanistic model is that no single factor is isolated or solely responsible for any effect. Rather, the best way to understand the cause of disparities is to focus on factor clusters and identify which factors are more strongly connected to other factors. The difficulty of changing the system is in how to untangle the causes and effects. Plucking just one data point from this graphic here would not necessarily collapse any cluster after all. One thing that is often missed in these conversations, usually due to the definitional confusion, is that both sides have strong persuasive cases. The complex mechanistic model is both elaborate and intuitive. The radial restorative model is satisfying and morally compelling. We can't automatically discount either model. It is worth it, rather, to weigh the shortcomings of their respective claims. I am not listing each model's weaknesses exhaustively. Instead, I'm giving my personal assessment with arguments I find most compelling. Though I have criticisms of the two models, I personally favor the complex mechanistic model, so if my criticisms seem unbalanced, that's why. Proponents of the complex mechanistic model have a reputation for being cold and unempathetic, and truth be told, that reputation is oftentimes well earned. This is why my biggest complaint about the complex mechanistic side is its rhetoric often fails to live up to its own understanding. Conversations about racial disparities start with, it's complicated, then quickly become bouts of reactionary finger pointing. This is understandable in one sense. The other side is certainly playing the blame game, and anytime behaviors and choices are brought up as a potential factor to these disparities, radial restoratives shoot it down, and may even call someone a nasty name or two for daring to bring it up. This results oftentimes in complex mechanistics swinging back with the claim that disparities, at their root, are there because people are simply choosing to be disparate. This woefully simplistic view not only poorly reflects one's diagnosis of the situation, but also makes any proposed solutions inadequate. This rhetoric ignores the rational, reasonable root of many behaviors, the effect of the temporal lag in progress, the hostile and perverse role of the state in institutions, and the reality of bias and discrimination. And the solutions that they give underestimate the difficulty and social cost of breaking from disenfranchisement. Even if we were to accept that disparities were solely caused by behavior, behaviors are complex. They respond and change due to many different factors. Statements like, just do X, underestimate the difficulty and complication of changing outcomes. Furthermore, to blame only choices is to fall for a fallacy the other side is using, assuming that when a negative outcome occurs, someone must be to blame. It should be the complex mechanistics who realize that not all causes and effects are someone's fault. Plenty of factors are without agent. Things happen without a reason. Some factors are random, chaotic, based on chance and luck, or a mere statistical aberration. This should shape how we describe the system and also how we think about affecting change. Because paradoxically, change in a complex system is inevitable but unpredictable and hard to control. Practically speaking, the solutions from the mechanistic side are not as clean or satisfying as simply closing gaps. Interventions that are effective with this model must start very early to get the most impact. To break vicious self-destructive cycles, the cost is going to be lots of investment, lots of time, and lots of energy. One might argue the state should not be involved in such interventions. Fair but without some external force, which could be charities, activists, churches, or concerned citizens, you must accept slow progress. And even if you do choose to invest in mechanistic solutions, the rewards of such an approach are not immediate. They take time to mature and show long-lasting effect. That can be a hard sell to people who want explicit prompt results. As for the radial restorative model, I find a lot of problems with both their descriptive and prescriptive claims. To the claim that all disparities can be traced back to racism, I find the argument is structured in a self-fulfilling manner. First, racism is not a precise cause. It can be attributed to feelings, 
attitudes, personal relationships, policies, historical events, legal restrictions, individual or corporate actions, biases, whether conscious or unconscious, segregation, forced or voluntary, language, explicit or implicit, that is just about anything. With such a large definition, finding it somewhere in the chain is inevitable. Second, within this description, there's no distinction between strong or weak correlations. There's no limit to the connection's distance. Keep digging until the connection is made, no matter how tenuous or how far removed. This also makes the finding inevitable. Lastly, society is intertwined by nature. All factors within it are connected at some intersecting point. Therefore, discovered connections are not compelling by themselves. These three points together show the argument has defined its own proof in such a way that it will be fulfilled no matter what. Another argument made is that the continuation of disparities proves that racism must still be the underlying cause, even if it's invisible. The problem is that it is perfectly possible for a destructive cycle of disparities to continue even when the original cause died out a long time ago. A disparity cycle can become self-perpetuating and liberated from their original trigger. The impact can itself become an underlying cause. Even if the cycle appears to be continuing a racist outcome, the reality is a new cause has replaced the old. Radial restoratives also tend to talk about disparities in isolation from each other. However, focusing on one particular disparity as evidence of racism ignores that disparities are often built upon by previous disparities. As an example, consider the SAT. You've probably heard people say the SAT is racist because you can see disparities on the scores between different racial groups. However, what does get talked about is that the disparity in SATs is not the first place within the chain where these disparities appear. If you go back to the disparity of prior test scores, it's going to be the same kind of disparity. You can also see the same disparities in attendance and suspensions, disparities in grades, disparities in literacy skills and the age of reading acquisition. And even further back, you can see the same disparities of poverty. So by looking at the end of the chain and pretending that's where the disparity began is very disingenuous. The proposed restorative solutions thus target disparities too far down in the chain. Incongruently with their conception of racism as the core issue, they attempt to solve disparities by manually closing them at the very end. Take black faculty and colleges as another example of this. If there is a disparity in the number of white and black faculty members at a college, a restorative measure would be to hire following a racial quota system. But does this solution address the real issues? What conditions led to the disparity in the first place? Was it prejudice from the hiring staff or was it the contributions of many other disparities leading up to a lack of black qualified applicants? Does a racial quota really solve the problem? This ties into another error in the restorative model, conflating the measurement of the outcome and the material outcome itself. An SAT score is not an arbitrary number. It is a representative value, a measurement of academic skill. You can think of income like this as well. Income is not an arbitrary value, but a calculated number that represents someone's negotiated earning power. Trying to solve an outcome by adjusting the measurement is a confusion of categories. Giving a person a lump sum of $10,000 does not change their earning power, any more than manually adding 100 points to an SAT score increases a student's academic skill. The true effect of closing disparities manually is that it conceals problems or moves them into the future. Minority students who are accepted into universities with lower test scores may, by their acceptance into the school, close the racial gap in admissions, but the underlying academic shortcomings reassert themselves later in poor grades, poor test scores, and poor retention, leading to even more negative outcomes. I stated at the beginning that neither side is truly arguing about systemic racism. For complex mechanistics, they reject the idea of systemic racism because they do not see explicit racism 
as a critical factor in the formation of disparities. For radial restoratives, they see systemic racism as a accumulation of past and present issues, with the historical role of racism radiating out and causing every disparity since. But if these two views don't capture the true essence of Carmichael's systemic racism, then what view truly does? Enter the critical holistic view. First, let's split some hairs. Critical scholarship is a broad topic that I don't intend to detail here, but it's been thrust into the public eye as of late, as have some of its offshoot movements. To be clear, traditional critical scholars like Derek Bell occupy a very different intellectual space from popular seminar speakers like Robin DiAngelo or Ibram X. Kendi. Without going into all those differences, though, what these individuals share is important preconceptions about how systemic racism works and what is required to solve it. Radial restorative can be said to be an incomplete version of this view, bastardized if you don't wish to be kind. However, the two views remain distinct. Descriptively, the critical approach uses a critical lens to analyze every facet of American life, here especially around the role of race. Its prescription, meanwhile, is unique. Rather than trusting in reform, progress, or lawfare, the holistic goal is to entirely dismantle institutions. Against the hopes of the restorative or even mechanistic views, critical holistics are deeply skeptical about the efficacy of using normal means. After all, the abolition of slavery, civil rights, anti-discrimination laws, legal reforms, and bias trainings have been so far insufficient. This occurs in their view not because the system is malfunctioning and needs to be fixed, but that the system is working exactly as intended, to perpetuate white dominance over non-white citizens. Critical holistics will give examples and statistics about the causes of disparities when it suits them, but ultimately they don't see these disparities as links in a causal chain. Causation is not their concern, and it is, for them, a distraction from the real problem. Furthermore, they encourage and support reparations, affirmative action, and racial quotas, but they do not think that these are the solutions to the deeper issues. What is the real issue? For them, the real issue is that we value white supremacist cultural values, such as individualism, rule of law, rationalism, timeliness, written language, scientific thinking, capitalism, competition, and so on. The system so foundationally is built to reward those cultural values that even non-whites who adopt them can end up succeeding. This is what creates the white adjacent. This, however, is perceived as a betrayal of cultural values, that non-whites must sacrifice and replace their natural cultural values to find success is itself an injustice. The solution then in their mind is to dismantle the system of cultural values and supplant it. Rather than simply adjusting the outcomes, the true critical view believes that the entire system must be uprooted. Perhaps this is a more coherent conclusion to the radial view. If the root of the system is racism, then the system as a whole is rotten and must be cut off. In comparison to the other two views, there are interesting points of convergence. When compared with the complex mechanistic view, for instance, both of these views agree that eliminating racist attitudes, individuals, and policies is not enough to get equal outcomes. Even if we removed all the racism out of those areas, we would still have disparities. They also surprisingly agree that changes in behavior, or in the critical view adoption of white cultural norms can yield different outcomes. The difference is, for the critical thinker, adopting white cultural norms is a betrayal and it's an immoral requirement. Meanwhile, for the radial restorative, they both agree that all disparities are essentially rooted in racism. They believe that the moral imperative is on the oppressive class to solve these issues. And they both generally agree that affirmative action, quotas, and reparations are moral responses to these problems. Now, I can guess what some people are thinking at this point. Maybe you're thinking, well, when I argue about systemic racism, 
right from the gate, I'm going to have a solid definition. We're going to hash out our meanings and the conversation is going to be super productive. And what I would actually suggest is if you intend to go into a conversation where the stated intent is to talk about systemic racism, don't talk about systemic racism. No matter how much you agree or disagree about the definition, what is ultimately going to happen is the same discussion people have had on YouTube forever. One side says systemic racism doesn't exist, the other side says it does, and meanwhile all the actual information and actual beliefs are going to stay under the surface. Get below the surface level. If the surface is this metaphysical, hard to grasp concept such as systemic racism, pull it down. Bring it into another term. Have another phrasing that gets at the question. Maybe you're talking about racial disparities, that maybe that's the discussion you actually want to have. And below that, what are the causes and effects in racial disparities? What are the factors that you take into consideration? And can you have disagreements or agreements about that? And then really, really what you should be talking about, the thing that is actually important to discuss is the underlying issues. Fairness, efficacy, needed reforms, measuring and monitoring success. What do we actually need to do? If the person you're speaking to rejects cause and effect, instead insisting that the cause is really the white supremacist system, then you know you're talking to a critical holistic. Don't let them make causal arguments such as quoting statistics or data points. Push them by asking, okay, if we solve that problem, is the system still racist? Ultimately, after a while, they should admit that cause and effect are not central to their view. Redirect their conversation to the notion of white cultural values. This idea is not well understood by regular people, and it's rather indefensible outside of certain niche academic cliques, so this is a point that you should get out of them. Finally, after establishing that they want to dismantle an institution, ask them for their plan of action. What is their vision for the future? What would they replace the institution with? For most of them, they don't have a cogent understanding of how to build an institution. And so this is almost always their weakest point of argument. So no matter your goal, what I hope this video helps you do is understand your own terms, understand other people's terms, understanding your own model of thinking, as well as competing models of thinking. And if you ever go into a conversation about this, that you know what it is you want to really discuss. Thanks for watching.